Hi, Matilda. Welcome to Basel. Thanks for joining us today in this conversation for the Swiss Design Awards online programming. I'm excited to be talking to you in the flesh. In public. <laughs> in public. <laughs> <laughs> Not through a screen. We've talked a lot through screens in the last seven months. We talk to each other generally. A lot. Telephone, computer. FaceTime. But on, you know, in the flesh doesn't happen so often has not happened so often in the last months. Yeah. You were in a spe specific special place when the pandemic sort of got completely out of control in Europe. It was a desert. Do you want to tell us about that? Like what was, your, what was your experience of pandemic <coughs> breakdown? First, first of all, yes, I came from a desert, kind of into a desert, from a desert to a desert. In a way, I mean, I choose to go in isolation in a way by uh, spending six weeks with the uh, artist Andrea Sittel, who very much is an artist, but she works very much on the kind of periphery uh, where she actually produces objects and clothing and uh, water colors. And her she built this huge test site in the middle of the Moyave Desert in Joshua Tree, where she said that she wants to use a whole area as a test site for her practice. Because mm. she actually was trained in New York where she found a gallerist and then she moved to LA but she comes from that kind of area and for her it was very natural because she also wanted to be independent as a practitioner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and have also through this kind of idea of isolation freedom because she doesn't say or she doesn't think that being in a remote place means that you um, are necessarily isolated but the limitations actually mean freedom much more than anything else because mm -hmm. also there's le less distraction mm -hmm. and her major question in her practice is how do we live or how do we strive to live and mm -hmm. she has this ideology of for example she only wears free like she doesn't like fashion but she obviously needs to clothe or put clothing on so she develops maximum three different types of outfits for herself that she reproduces five times, so she works it, uh, wears it seasonal. So mm -hmm. she doesn't think about wearing something else. She doesn't think about how she has to represent herself to the outside world every day, but being maybe like, you know, like having this new modern gesture of a certain style or material, mm -hmm. uh, she wants to fully focus on, on, on her work. So I've been there for, mm -hmm. uh, technically it was planned four weeks, that uh, when the lockdown came and uh, the virus spread it, uh, she suggested to me, why don't you stay? Why do you want to be in a city like Berlin that is crowded and uh, probably have to be in lockdown by in your apartment for a few weeks, months? We didn't know. No mm -hmm. one knew. Mm -hmm. No one still does. And she was very generous in allow allowing me to stay. And it was kind of nice because in the beginning there was a team, you know. She works with a metalsmith, she works with, with a few weavers, you know, because her practice is so overly, like, like, like very hybrid, you know. Uh, and suddenly it was uh, me, her partner, uh, the two ca cats, or three ca two cats, I think it is, and uh, three dogs, and me. And I, c I sometimes didn't see anyone for days, you know. And my sometimes I didn't see her because I helped her producing um, some of the bowls that represent the practice. Um, and that was also re really nice because it was one of these things that I rarely do as a curator mm -hmm. in, uh, in the recent years, that you would wa really wake up and go in production, physical manual labor mm -hmm. the whole day. And you put your apron on, you produce something and you leave. And it's also interesting how I, it reminded me of how a practitioner that actually has a very dedicated practice uh, works from morning to evening and then it's done you know mm -hmm. of course you m mentally you're still acu occupied with yeah. the work that you do but I liked I like the structure that was delivered mm -hmm. to me by me joining her you know and learning also from her and it's also an opportunity to stay put no because like that's basically what characterizes a kind of life like yours is the traveling everywhere you know following the circus everywhere it goes opening here exhibition there I like working the metaphor here. following the circus everywhere <laughs> i mean it, it is a bit of a circus now i yeah. mean we sort of just uh, meet in these sort of uh, forums for discussion to check out what's going on in the design world and so on and trying we to contribute here and there yeah, be part of it you know mm. make projects here i'm presenting mm -hmm. a little thing here i'm doing a little round table there and you know you 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 forced yourself to stay put and then you 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 
actually then were confronted with the fact that you had to stay put for a bunch of months afterwards, but you didn't choose to stay in the desert. I mean, I think that it's very interesting this turn from uh, observing to producing, that you chose to take this turn um, even before the lockdown started, and then when it started, you even stayed there a bit longer. But ultimately, you decided to come back to Berlin. I decided to come to, co uh, to Berlin because it, uh, it w I mean, it was a conflicted situation because I mean, I would not be the priority patient in an American healthcare system, you mm, know, totally. even though I have a European healthcare system that kind of provides for me. So it was, I wasn't sure if that could kind of pan out. And I mean, the desert was obviously, it's extremely isolated. Mm -hmm. um, but also when I left, there was a lot of anger from, from the local community because a lot of people from California, from especially like, you know, from the West Coast, a lot of LA, people from LA, California, they knew that they would find some sort of kind of, you know, like better state than being in a city during mm -hmm. isolation. Mm -hmm. But you cannot do that. You, you should not travel in this extreme mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, situation because then you distribute. You know, sure. and that's so difficult, which is uh, completely ironic because I'm sitting here with you, uh, having this conversation. While uh, technically I should have stayed technically in mm -hmm. in, in Berlin, mm -hmm. but I'm also in this very difficult situation where I'm a freelancer, mm -hmm. and uh, work in Berlin has never been flourishing. Mm -hmm. uh, but also I have not, I'm not there since a long time. Mm -hmm. You know that I did this. Uh, a visiting professorship in the architecture and design department in the School of Art Institute that also brought me the American culture very, very closely. And, uh, and then, and that also was a time when I actually get to know Andrea's practice mm -hmm. and I was extremely interested in it. But if I may, if you allow me, I would like mm -hmm. to mention one thing that I really l enjoyed from her uh, is, is in terms of how, what kind of rituals you introduce in mm -hmm. your daily practice when you work with a community or you work with pe practitioners mm -hmm. or other practitioners that support your uh, practice. It's power hour. The concept of power hour is magical because, you know, think about it. People come into an office or a studio and they work the whole day, they're exhausted, they're drained, and then towards the end, they are asked to maybe clean up after themselves mm -hmm. and then they go. But she she thinks power hour is the connector between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. where we would meet Tuesdays to really like clean the floor in an outdoor area. But it's a ritual, it's a gesture of manual labor. So we activate certain parts of your body in, in, in a way in the morning, but also you have this moment of connectivity mm -hmm. where you speak with everyone else that works with you and discuss little things of the things that you've did, the, things, the, the book that you read that kind of inspired you or, or sparked mm -hmm. some sort of thought mm -hmm. and idea. Um, and then you, after this hour you, you go to work and usually that kind of ritual from and the concentration and the organization that you do in the morning leads you through the whole process of a day. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it, I've witnessed over six weeks how well organized mm -mm. everything is and structured and through the structure, the, 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 I always had the feeling that the team is extremely you know, like in e on ease, e, as you say, mm -hmm. on ease, in at ease. ease. It, at ease. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, totally. I mean, that's very interesting because again, this turn from observing to producing and again, this turn from a passive engagement with whatever work it is that you do, um, this passive engagement, of course, comes from a privileged uh, perspective because we are privileged enough to be able to be sitting at a computer the whole day mm. and other people do have to do manual physical labor as their work. Um, and the fact that you reconnect with your body and with your feelings, mm. it makes you much more engaged with whatever it is that you're doing, mm. you know, and, and it, 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 it makes you sort of break the boundary from this passive engagement to, to a more active way of engaging with mm. things. And it also makes you question a lot of things much more, I think. I have to double check this. Do you, do you think that, uh, that it's a privilege for us to sit at the laptop and work? Oh, I think so. Oh, really? I mean, imagine if you have to pick strawberries for a living, you know? That is pretty hardcore work. I would say that we're pre pretty privileged that we can sort of sit at a chair. Okay, but imagine if a future designer is not a designer that is fully a designer, mm. that is trained in different kind of things within the community, you know, knows how to, I don't know, uh, pick asparagus. Do you say pick, you know, collect asparagus and pick strawberries and do all these kind of labor related things. And then you build a community around it. And then mm -hmm. the, the designer acts when he or she is needed, you mm -hmm. know, instead of like implying or imposing this kind of idea that partly or maybe are not necessarily, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, this would be a very interesting... And then, and then you have this idea of a balance. You have this yeah. idea of, you know, someone... It's like the Mary Poppins effect. Mary Poppins comes, 
when she's needed, when she's mm -hmm. done, she disappears. And mm -hmm. I always like, I like this kind of metaphor of Mary mm -hmm. Poppins, this appearing person, mm -hmm. supporting, helping, kind of you know, like ruling, being neg neg negotiated. That's also what curators necessi like in, in, mm -hmm. in, in a way should do. And maybe designers also in the near future. Maybe. So how was the lockdown then in Berlin? I mean, in the end, it was a different kind of isolation, um, but it was also an isolation. It, it was a total isolation, but I have to say that I was maybe not a particular fan of Berlin before I left. I, and, you know, I came back from, Calif from, from living in Chicago in August 2019. And then I had to get used to this city that, you know, mm -hmm. it's a great city because everyone passes by. Berlin. Mm -hmm. Everyone comes to Berlin f sooner or later within mm -hmm. the year. But I had my issues, you know, it with the me me mentality, um, w with some sort of combined I uh, attitudes and ideals. I also didn't necessarily had uh, local work uh, in that kind of sense. I mean, we worked on various projects and I had other things to do. But I wasn't sure if it's a city for me. And then I decided to go to the desert. And um, when I came back from isolation to isolation, I started to like it. Hmm. Because suddenly the city that is also, you know, like busy and energetic and uh, distracting become, became my desert, you know. And then I took a bike and I, I discovered the whole city, you know. Mm -hmm. I drove everywhere and I pretended sometimes that I'm, this is a huge exhibition <laughs> about <laughs> Berlin that I have to discover myself <laughs> and make the city my own, you know. Yeah. Like it's the same thing when you go into an exhi exhibition. Not all exhibits are your favorites. Mm -hmm. There's always one or two things that mm -hmm. talk to you, that touch your heart, you know, that make you energetic and, and you take the knowledge back to the next project that you mm -hmm. do. So I was really, um, it was my, it's my relationship with the city started through the lockdown, you know, mm -hmm. and now it's opening up and I'm like getting more <laughs> critical again. <laughs> 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 like, mm, maybe I should live in the countryside. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting because I think that, that what the lockdown did for a lot of us is it forced us to sort of stay put, it for forced us to pay attention to what's in, yeah. Im in our immediate yeah. surroundings and mm -hmm. we haven't been forced to do that. Maybe. Yeah our entire lives yeah. um, and, th and that's a very interesting uh, thing I mean it, it can be a lonely experience for mm. some people it can be maddening for other people mm. but most people that I've talked to that did have the sort of jet setting life don't miss it at all no. because I it really takes know. such a toll on you and it's no. just uh, you also don't it's miss it but it's a conversation we had uh, yes la la last night uh, together about you know like the physical strength that I gained in the last past months, you know, mm -hmm. for, from daily rituals of exercise and work and, and uh, the regular eating mm -hmm. and, and suddenly. And now I, I had to travel the last six, seven days for, for work here in Switzerland. And I sleep, wor is I sleep bad. Uh, I'm extremely rest less mm -hmm. um, and I don't like that state. I personally really don't like mm -hmm. it. So I, I actually think the, the future for everyone should be to kind of understand the locality of mm -hmm. things and, and your landscape and how you can work with that kind of locality mm -hmm. and that kind mm -hmm. of like side. But uh, one anecdote that I have to tell and I, I really wanted to always to say that in public <laughs> <laughs> is um, <laughs> one problem that I have with Berlin also, I'm Polish, I'm Polish born, I have a double mm. citizenship and I know so many people in Berlin that are Berliners, they've never been to Poland. It's 70 kilometers away from the border. It's like, it's, it's, it's pure ignorance I in a way, but I also can uh, imagine that maybe it needs, you know, like, uh, you know, like mediation in a kind of mm -hmm. sense. And now that I've met a lot of people, they say, oh, we, I would like, you know, go. But I think, you know, you'd rather go to Milan and to Costa Rica and to <laughs> fly to New York than <laughs> taking a car or a train and going 70 kilometers to your, so I think it's about revisiting. Yeah. Everything. And paying attention again to yep. what's near. No, I yeah. mean, I think you will find a lot of things also about yourself. Um, but yeah, I mean, the truth is there was also, you know, everybody was forced to sort of look at the place where they are and, and sort, of try, sort of try and engage and create a relationship with it if they didn't have, like in your case. Yeah. But at the same time, what we've seen as well is a bunch of like cultural institutions, museums, biennials, really scrambling to do a digital turn, right? Really scrambling, like uh, suddenly out of nowhere, every single museum is doing a tour er online. You can see it, you can access it. There's like all these talks, there's like all these uh, crazy uh, digital programming happening and so on. And um, that is like super, 
s very quickly done. It was very quickly done. We were all forced to do it, but you didn't engage with it at all. I remember we had a conversation where I was telling you about how, yeah, so today there's this, like this live and I'm listening to it while I'm cooking dinner and then tomorrow there's this conference and I'm just listening to it while da 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 da, -da. And then and then <laughs> <laughs> you were just like, I refuse to engage with any of this digital content. <laughs> 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 right? I mean, yeah. you didn't see anything. Yeah, no, I didn't. I it's almost great. Didn't, I almost didn't see anything, but it's it's more related to the fact that um, during that time I was doing this this class uh, at about speculative studies at the AA architecture school, and it sucked my energy out because I never choose to become a teacher. It came a little bit to me, um, and I love working with people. And I think the energy that you can occupy with a group of people in a space. And the, you know, like this human touch, the, the glance into your eyes, mm. understanding if someone feels comfortable with it or not, negotiating it, I think it's such a major thing to do. Yeah. And I understand that people say now that this remote working or remote teaching is the future, is the present and should be the future. And for some people, it completely applies. But I don't necessarily believe in it. And, and the, the workshop that I did the, at the Design Academy last week, that was at the critical uh, inquiry lab uh, run by Saskia uh, von Stein, where I introduced choreography in the design curriculum, uh, proved for me that there was such a craving of, of you know, movement within space, mm -hmm. but also engagement. And of course, in the beginning of the class, I had to make sure that every student of this 18 student feels comfortable with being in the space, maybe not wearing a mask. I mean, they were, of course, they were allowed to, to wear it or, in, in, I mean, encouraged also to wear it. But they choose not to because they said we, we are now master students together and we will be in this class like together for the, the next time. two years. Yeah. So we, we choose to um, engage with each other on a supposedly normal way. Mm -mm. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting if you refused to engage, I mean, because you had other stuff to do, because also like I also refuse to, to, to believe that we have to be productive during the pandemic uh, yeah. lockdown. I refuse to, to endorse that idea because I feel like you don't. I mean, you're just trying to survive the time. It was there was such a degree of uncertainty, yeah. you know, that why is it that we are forced uh, in pushing ourselves to mm. produce more when in fact we should be thinking seriously, rethinking what we are doing, you know. And I mean, when you continue then continue to start uh, working in a more, let's say, regular pace, let's say, um, what do you encounter? What what have you encountered? How do you how do you find designers and the design scene and the design actors that you are coming into contact with? I mean, uh, maybe I can bridge it to uh, the exhibitions that I'm doing at the Museum für Gestaltung uh, together with Damian Fopp, um, who I know from the time uh, when I was co-running uh, Depot Basel here in Basel. And I mean, he's a trained designer s as much as I am. So mm -hmm. it's a really interesting to have that discourse from a making position with him about mm -hmm. you know analyzing um, the possibilities the design has have has today. And when we started to come up with this theme of total space, which is very ironic, <laughs> <laughs> talking about total space within a uh, pandemic. Uh, we coined the term total space because we realized that there's a huge craving of, of designers or people or practitioners that work on the border to design or with design methodologies um, to think not within a singular object or a singular thing that you in the I exhibition context observe or look at, but that you walk through design, not as an interior, but as a, as a you know, like experience, like, a, like maybe it could be described as a totally designed spatial experience mm -hmm. in a way. And we first of all coined the term total space because you know total design has been in the 20th century through Wim Crowell's total design or Florence Knoll's total design. Terminologies that were used already are still used but also used in architecture. Uh, but then you have the Gesamtkunstwerk of Richard Wagner from the century before uh, that was always a playground for artists to make this gesamt, you know, like this, this mm -hmm. overall overarching mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, physical, experiential, immersive, mm -hmm. sometimes interactive mm -hmm. or participatory mm -hmm. uh, spaces. So we thought, why don't we take that into a design museum where, you know, I mean, I don't think that, that uh, I mean, there's a lot of um, try and push from a lot of museums to, to try to engage the public uh, with this kind of new display methodologies. 
But we thought that by uh, commissioning fifth contemporary pr five contemporary practitioners, which are Quentin Caputo, uh, Trix and Robert Hausmann, and then Luftek from Chicago, and then uh, Safbarok from London, and uh, Suchuk and Bratwurst from Berlin. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that we thought it would be everything would be analog and physical, but through the conversations we realized that some of these students are really on the board of working in the, f in the digital sp sphere. And then lockdown came and the whole exhibition is produced in an online chat room, mm -hmm. like on Zoom calls. So we playing with these methodologies of physical and digital in this space, also with, visual, uh, with the graphic design and the communications that we did with uh, Tristesse, that are also here from, from uh, Basel. And I'm really curious how the audience will perceive it mm -hmm. because it's a um, you know it's a very uplifting it's a experiential kind of exhibition and obviously through corona we are only limited to a certain amount of people that will have access in the exhibition but i'm really curious how this eight month exhibition because also in terms of sustainability we thought it's really important if you build a whole exhibition in a museum you cannot take it down after three months mm -hmm. you know a, to test a theme, you know, exhibitions are beautiful test grounds for, 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 for di uh, uh, disciplines, but also to test what it could mean. It needs at least six months or seven. Mm -hmm. and, and now also we're to gather to some intelligence about what yeah. it is that happened, because yeah. after three months the yeah. dust has barely settled yeah. and you're already like, again, you know, going yeah. back to the circus and changing things. I mean, it's God, very I interesting. I love the circus. No, I mean, it's very <laughs> interesting because I uh, you know, you were actually advocating for new ways of interaction mm -hmm. uh, within the design discipline, but also new ways of interaction with different audiences. And also you're advocating for a different temporality. Yeah. You're advocating for a temporality that allows for analysis, assessment, reflection on what it is that we're doing. And I find that is very lacking in, in design discourse today. In general, right? And now we should sp speak about Foreign Legion, I think. Yeah, well, <laughs> but before I actually wanted to ask you about a um, little bit more about uh, Total Space, because you say mm. that it tries to bridge the gap between um, digital and analog experience. Mm -hmm. Could you give us an example of how that is achieved, or do you don't want to talk no, about it? No, no, I totally. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about it. You know, like I it was not expected for, like, we didn't in, uh, initiate it in the beginning, but obviously in the contemporary d uh, design exhibition, and, and I really have to say, I prefer to work with people who are alive and not people who are dead, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but also, I really don't <laughs> trust how history was written mm. or, you know, or settled or confirmed, sure. you know. Uh, but uh, it was interesting how, for example, the studio Sutsuk and Bratwurst, who mainly work in the digital realm, at some point in the conversation about the setup, they said, but it has to also work in the internet because the internet is also a space, you know? And then it opens a, a conversation of, okay, what does it mean when you make an exhibition and only a certain amount of people in Zurich that come to Zurich yeah. will see the exhibition? What is the after effect of it? How, does it docu how will it be documented? How will it be seen and perceived in the online thing? Which is a discussion that is happening right now in these online platforms that people try to develop this kind of new methodologies of experiencing art and architecture yeah. and design. So it shifted very strongly initially to this idea of digital presence and physical presence. And then we realized that the fact that we produced our exhibition in Zoom, and I mean, Trix and Robert Hausmann did their first Zoom call with Damien and me two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> and they did it better than anyone else, you know? <laughs> but they are natural talkers, you know? Mm. And they are natural, so, 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 I don't know, so sincere with what they say about their own practice, you know? Uh, so we thought we want to, in the graphic design, where we have, uh, like, you know, like there's a finger, there's a hand, there's a finger with a, Glove that is basically uh, ha like like a sanitize how sanity like how do you call sanitary it glove, yeah. sanitary glove and we picked the color Pantone color serenity because we want also you know we want to support the 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 fact that we we demand not we don't demand it's too negative it's more like we wish that people get a new serenity in the situation we're in, because you know how it is. You, you go into a bus and there's this car graffiti that we still have to learn, you know? And then the question of people who want to wear a mask, people who don't or refuse, uh, or people who actually are completely against it and even like, I don't know, uh, stage uh, protests against it, which mm -hmm. is ridiculous because that means that you, yeah, I mean, there's a reason why it's called masking for a friend because it's not only about you, it's about everyone else, you know? and. 
We thought that we with kind of little gestures within the exhibition, we also tackled the fact that this exhibition is taking place and was produced in mm -hmm. these extreme times. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm curious. And it opens when? 23rd of October <laughs> and runs until <laughs> the 20th, 20th uh, June 2021. Okay, very good. Yeah. So, but then going back to, you said you wanted to talk about Foreign Legion. Of course I, I want to talk about Foreign Legion. That's what we, we do together. Yeah, that's what we do together. We have a, so we know, like together. someone's it's making a video it's about a, it. It's a, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a joint, it's a joint uh, it started creation. It started, started here in Basel. It started here in Basel. Yeah. It started because of Basel somehow. Somehow, yeah. Whatever that means. Maybe not. To uh, keep it as a secret yeah. and everyone can yeah. imagine it. Imagine, imagine what it can why, mean. yeah. I mean, no, about, about Foreign Legion, what I, what I want to talk about, or to start the conversation about Foreign Legion, what I want to talk about is the idea of access, right? Mm -hmm. You were just talking about access. The digital turn is also something that has to do with access, although many of us are just sort of brain dead and don't have any time or patience to engage with all the content that is produced. But um, going back to the idea of access, um, there are two things that I wanted to talk about. One is the idea that within the design scene and, and, and the design world, it seems to be increasingly more and more so difficult to, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to, break, to break out of this kind of like networks of influence, people we already know, people that we already talk about. You know, it feels like, you know, there's a lot of the usual suspects. It's a, in part, it's a generational thing because there is a certain generation that was graduating from a certain number of schools. They became friends. They continued to work together and so on. But one thing that I really like about Foreign Legion and the work that we do uh, with Foreign Legion is that we have this 50% rule. So we never work with more than 50% of people that we already know of or have worked with. To complement ourselves, the, the, the greatest thing that I think about is that it happened. You know, mm. it's like when we started to do the projects that we did, and you remember, you, r you know how I'm still traumatized that when we opened Depot Basel, we, had, we opened it with seven, no, eight men and one woman. Um, and the fact that we naturally never had to discuss it, but it was almost like a method of operation from the beginning, mm -hmm. that it was clear for us that we never only work with our network, but that we insist that in all the projects that we have access to, we bring new voices, mm. new people that have or that should have a voice, and that's how we expand. You know, mm -hmm. and then it's a f when the fifty percent rule is applied, it becomes it becomes a standard. And mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it and then it, it, it also it also not it's not it's not about gender. It's not about where you come from in the globe. It's also about which discipline that you you are working in because and it's also about distribution. And it's about distribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, because you know design itself, like this 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 notion of design that that has been circulating for the best part of the, of the last 150 years, it is something that has been under questioning, under fire, really uh, recently. And 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 with the pandemic, I think it becomes more urgent than ever. And it's just it's just something that is in the mind of everybody. And I think with Total Space uh, at the Museum für Gestaltung, what you are doing is in a, in a way expanding the definition of what the discipline is, but also just very naturally uh, stating that it is something that bridges uh, the borders that have Absolutely. been imposed mm -hmm. for it. It just, it, that's how ex it exists in the mm -hmm. contemporary. There is no more, it should be like this, it should be like that. And there's also no more this is who a designer should be. Because but that is very a very fluid thing that is completely falling apart. But right that's now. the thing, you know, like the whole notion of transdisciplinarity always is somewhere there, you know? Mm -hmm. Always being somewhere. But it never comes into practice. Think about funding. There's no funding for transdisciplinary pra practices, you know, that's or projects. True. So you have to apply for a project in the architecture department because you have to claim that it's architecture, mm -hmm. and then true. and then it has to be designed because you know, and then and then the uh, a lot of artists maybe sometimes refuse to be part of a design exhibition because uh, the the methodologies around it and the wording around it, it's, it's so commercialized and sometimes lacks value or meaning or, or r response. But is it, you know, it's the problem is when it's constructed. And it's actually, sometimes I wish that I've never been trained as a designer uh, because I have really learned this kind of, it's, it's, I don't think it's, I, I'm not want to build kind, kind of cliches. I think it's toxic, but uh, there's something about the, a lot of methodologies are still trained in design uh, schools, and I've seen plenty, you know, from, from mm -hmm. within the system. 
that you have to come up with an idea for something and you have to draw it up now. So here is the solution, here's the, the idea and here, you, here are you. And then it's a linear, linear road. So uh, back to failure, failure should be embraced. It should be maybe a course, you know, like how to failure. I have no idea, mm -hmm. <laughs> just saying something. No, no, of course. I but, mean. but this kind of, you know, the moment of serendipity and, and, you know, reaction, the material and experiments and things that happen, you know, and that you bring different voices and people in and metho methodologies and that you maybe experiment with, I don't know, uh, concrete and, and, and clay and then maybe do an explosion here and there and then this ma material fusions come about or something like that. But that don't you think that is something that is completely ingrained in, in the fact that actually what we are doing is that we are following a linear narrative about what it means to become a designer. So the exactly. same way the same way that we yeah. shatter those ideas, we need to shatter them in education, we yeah. need to shatter them in funding structures and yeah. supporting structures and so yeah. on because in fact you should encourage students to have a variety of resources at their dis yeah. uh, at their availability that they can just pick and draw and discuss what they want to do by themselves. Yeah. But because they have not been encouraged by their whole educational uh, path to do things in that non-linear way, I mean, we are living in a time where the dominant narrative is the one that you have to behave in a certain way to succeed in a certain way. You have to complete this task and complete that task and complete that task. And it's sort of like a a video game, you know, where you're just like, oh, here's a level, chapter and one. chapter, <laughs> you know, and 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 then you fight the boss at the end and you, you win. Stars. But 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 <laughs> actually, we should just, you know, on the one hand, there's more than one possible narrative. On the other hand, we should also embrace the fact that the narrative does not have to be linear at all. Shouldn't and that's be. why mm -hmm. and that's why failure is such mm -hmm. a big part of the process. I mean, I feel like our lives, I mean, not specifically <laughs> yours and mine, but in general are a bunch of trial and error, yeah, one after the other. But, no? but that's why the example, for example, you know, like the, the interesting thing is that in hiring situations, you still ask, where did you study? Yeah, Who do course. you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who do you work for? But I mean, isn't it questions that like, what is the most exciting thing that happened to you in life? Hmm. How do you think has y y your living room has to feel, you know? And I thought yeah. it was interesting how a student once said to me, I want to feel it, like comfort is like, being underneath a shower. It's like, so why don't you design a space like that? You know? you know, it's interesting you talk about feelings because I was just reading this text that James Taylor Foster just wrote about how feelings should be, uh, you know, taken into account in Absolutely. everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, also have been one of the one of the things that has been uh, under questioning recently. And I, and I find, yes, of course, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the idea that we have to envision a more holistic future for the practice of design. Uh, or but this also allocate spaces for it. Yeah, it mean, means that we need to make space for these yeah. things, you know, and make space for diverse voices, diverse perspectives, diverse uh, kinds of opinions, and 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 feelings also, I guess, um, would be part of a part of the conversation. But you know, we're talking about a change that happens at uh, from from the ground up. You know, that's what we're talking. But the thing is, and we both know, that change is not going to happen if it only happens from the ground up. It needs to and happen also mm -hmm. from from the top. So yeah. the funding structures, the governmental agencies, the schools or whatever body that decides educational formats that are implemented in schools, they need to, 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 to get with the program. But you it's know? usually the people who are responsible for it. and. A lot of people don't want to have that change, you know? Is it because it's a threat to them? Is it a, a threat to the order that we know? I mean, the world is going to, to shambles anyway, where it's like we're experiencing the end of the world live right now. So why not change? I mean, it can't get worse than it is already, or? I don't know. I think it can always get worse. When I talk to my <laughs> uh, my, uh, my my when I talk to <laughs> my my it's family, my grandparents, or also my, my parents who actually like like by being refugees from Poland to Germany, mm. like they started their life so many times from scratch. Mm. You know, like mm -hmm. I had this conversation the other day with my dad. We was like saying, you know, Matilda, there was one moment where we, uh, I think I was 42 where where we actually had money in the bank account. And my, my people, I mean, my people, my parents own an apartment, have free cars, go on a holiday four times a row. It's possible, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think trauma and crisis is good because it's a moment to revisit things and mm -hmm. think about it. If this wouldn't have happened today, we wouldn't have this conversation, you know, which is glorious moment mm -hmm. of my week, <laughs> <laughs> talking about the circus. <laughs> but also, um, 
we wouldn't rethink the different tools that we have at hand and what it needs, that feeli feelings have to be accounted, that mm -hmm. what are the tools and ideas and systems that could be applied and then how could be yeah. they become reality? I mean, on the one hand, is a crisis of a categorization, like the way that we've labeled and organized the world doesn't work anymore. On the other hand, it's also a crisis of, of, uh, of imagination, really. Like, we, we, we haven't been able to come up with, with things. So the only way is to be pushed to uh, forced to to come up with new solutions and on the other hand i also think that the times that we are living in should be times in which we really learn to embrace this comfort you know because we've been comfortable for for a while but it it's not it's not going to be like that anytime soon and because from out of that discomfort comes the will to create, to change, to be annoyed. I mean, we only started Foreign Legion because we were both very annoyed about a particular set of, 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 uh, of conditions that we were fundamentally against. And it's like the same thing. I mean, you, you, when something hurts you, that's when you're like, okay, I'm gonna do something about it because it cannot be that, uh, that things stay the same. They I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just laughing because you know that the truth is that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, we, that we started Foreign Legion because I actually mentioned it in an interview and then <laughs> oh yeah, that's Toga Bayerle called us and, and she said- That was published in a I really a like what you guys said, well, why don't you- uh, So that's also true, like th it's about <laughs> manifesting what you want, no? I mean, you said in an interview, I am doing this project. And in fact, we were just having conversations. But that's why- And what then I the say project happened. But that's why I say to my students all the time, I think that Nothing comes to you in a way. You have to claim space, yeah. and you and if and if you ask, you don't get. You know, and oh, that's our maximum. That's one maximum. of one of our maximum. What's the second one? Uh, make them dream. Make them dream. I always have to make them dream. Make them dream. Yeah. I mean, it is it is about manifesting what. Uh, I mean, I, this sounds like boy, it's going in a very new agey direction. I like love that. Please, no, no. Next I mean, to circuits, it's a, it's a little <laughs> bit too much. But I mean, it's about manifesting within the constraints that you have. Uh, trying to claim space for yourself. And uh, yeah, it's true. Nobody's going to give that space to you. You need to claim it. You need to get it out. Uh, you need to get out and go, and go claim it yourself. And it's not, it's not that it's easy work. It's like fighting, fighting uh, things and ideas that have been sort of established for decades. But yeah, but I, 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 I there's one moment in time that I don't like fully agree uh, with mm. you r right now. I don't think it's fighting. Mm. Fighting always has a negative connotation, mm. and you, you are also actually totally, as me, totally against negative connotations. It's more about suggesting something. You know, if you if you're not happy about a certain state, you have to suggest an alternative. Fighting, it's more about proposing, yeah, showing, yeah, make them dream. Yeah. So fact. if we, we, for example, in our methodologies of working as foreign legion, we say that we have, ap you know, applying this fifty percent rule. And we talk about it more often. Hopefully, someone sees that. It's the same, like you know, the, the posters that we did for the German architecture pavilion. I mean, one poster says, uh, "What took you so long?" Mm. <laughs> and then the second one says, "It wasn't easy, uh, easy after all." I mean, it represents exactly that. Why can't an uh, institution decide today that to from tomorrow on they will have a 50% rule? Why can't they decide that the executive board should not be full of old people, but also maybe? take in a younger generation that knows exactly what they want. I'm, I mean, I'm, f I'm amazed how when you give, you know, this young generation of future practitioners space, they know how to claim it. They, they also don't have a tendency to abuse it in some other way. Mm -hmm. They want different things that our generation wants. Mm -hmm. They want very different things what the generation before us wants. But there's a level, there needs also a level of trust. Mm -hmm. And when I sometimes observe sometimes some universities that I teach at, there's a lot of distrust and a lot of control. You mm -hmm. know? And micromanaging. And micromanaging. Oh my so God. when else you can, you mean, it's not about being successful on the first day of your studies, you know? It's it's more about trying the boundaries of a discipline, claiming it for you, testing it, testing it with other people that you have access to, because that's a moment when you have that, you know, you have your around this, under this, mm. you know, like umbrella of possibilities and you have all these workshops uh, that you have at hand and you lose them at some point. You mm -hmm. use the ability to, to yeah, have I that mean kind you of... You can't cut people's wings and then c complain that they're not flying, right? Like you didn't give them the chance. Exactly. Well, we need to come to a close with our conversation. How should we do it? I would like to ask you um, 
I would like to ask you actually about uh, word of advice. I feel like we've talked about words of advice, but I feel like the, the generation that is applying um, in these years to the Swiss Design Awards is also claiming new mm -hmm. ways of doing things, new spaces for mm -hmm. themselves, new practices that a little bit defy traditional categorization. Um, but hit by this pandemic, where a lot of things that we knew are going to, that how they worked, they are going to change, forced to change, maybe sometimes not for the best, and where, you know, a lot of designers are losing jobs, commissions are not coming, like, <laughs> that often knocking at your door. How do you think, or what do you think could be the attitude that this, that you would like to see in this young generation. Maybe they already have it, but I feel I find it's, however, a, a bit of a discouraging moment, and it's a moment where maybe people are rethinking a lot and having mini existential crises. Early midlife crisis is <laughs> forced on <laughs> by the pandemic. Um, I mean, it, there's no straightforward answer to this question. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, a part of me is exactly what I said before earlier, this kind of idea of uh, um, Mary Poppins syndrome, mm. if that would not be something that, you know, that you, did you bring your design skills into practice when they're actually needed? And maybe it's really about thinking about the, what the community needs, what you also need to be part of a community and to build structures that allow you that kind of freedom, you know, it's like exactly like uh, Andreas Sittel, who really claimed a certain space for herself and produces the work and is c pretty independent from, from a demanding Struck art structure. Um, I mean, I don't personally also don't know how it's gonna work out with fairs and and I mean exhibitions are limited. The exhibition that I'm opening at the Museum für Gestaltung Total Space will be also limited to uh, only a certain amount of people for the opening and mm -hmm. for the duration at at least in the mm -hmm. first uh, mm -hmm. months. So I I don't know. I don't have a gr grand finale of advice. Um, mm -hmm towards the end. I just think that... Um, Somehow I think it's you're talking or you're hinting oh, So you we don't need a solution now. I no, think no, no, it exactly. It's maybe against solutionism yeah. and this idea that you should just sort of strive to keep going and be agile enough that you understand how you need to shift and change and adapt. But also, you know, like from a lot of people getting fired or, or being downgraded in terms of, of work hours, like, take the time you have right now. I mean, like, I, I, from, the, from the most exciting practice, uh, practitioners that I know, they, they take two months holidays. I mean, it sounds like a luxury, but it's not that you go on two week holidays and you're laying on the beach. You read, you draw, you know, you sketch, you observe, you learn from an environment, you don't reproduce existing things, but, but you, 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 take your, you take your home, creative imagination into a state where you can, f you know, like where, where you can thrive. I mean, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, I read more books than in the last year, for example, because suddenly you had, through this isolation, you had, your body craved it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I also realized that now, through things that are opening up, people crave being part of something. And maybe it's nice that there's less, you know? And then mm -hmm. what you have, you engage more with, and you mm -hmm. take it not for granted. Mm -hmm. you know. so yeah. Okay, I would say those are wise words to come to a close. Not taking things for granted. There we go. Thank you very much for inviting me there. Thank you, Matilda. It's been a pleasure. Talk to you very soon. Yes, definitely.